All right, the PL drug dealer here. <laughs> um, yeah, I will give a brief talk about PCP, a tool that I built, I think, two years ago, and I think it's different from all the it's, uh, all the other talks that we had today because this is something that builds on top of lib P2P this time. So first of all, if you don't know what it is, um, I've got a GIF here. So uh, so I called it peer copy, um, and the name actually comes from so that we have CP on the command line and SCP, and I wanted to have something that's resembles some of the, sort of this peer theme, so I called it peer, PCP, so it's peer copy. And peer copy is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer file transfer tool, and you can see it on the, uh, here, so we have, well, two machines or two computers. The left one types into the command line PCP send, and then the f name of the file. PCP spits out four unique uh, words, and the receiving side takes these four words and just types into the command line PCP, oh, it should be receive, not send, again. And uh, both peers will be automatically and magically find each other and uh, connect to each other. The receiving peer needs to confirm the file transfer and then both, uh, yeah, transfer the file. Or, well, the sending peer sends the file to the receiving peer. Um, this, so if, you're, if you know of tools like Croc or Magic Wormhole, this might be familiar to you. And mm, I, I'm not sure, does anyone know Croc or Magic Wormhole from here? Yeah, you know, you know, okay, a few hands. And so this is my attempt of decentralizing these tools. So all of these tools that you can see at the top, well, at least Croc and Magic Worm Wormhole, um, use centralized servers to facilitate uh, peer discovery and uh, data relaying. And yeah, so th these were my baby steps with LibP2P building this tool. So um, I got to, know with, uh, got to know all these concepts in there and I thought this is a cool, cool project that I could work on. And so my idea with this talk is just to give a brief overview of how it works, and then at the end, yeah, have a, have a call out to the community. So, so at the high level, let's assume as always, Alice sends something to Bob. Um, and at a very high level, Alice um, generates a CID, writes it somewhere in the DHT. The CID is transferred to Bob, and Bob does just a lookup for this provider record that Alice has written to the DHG. And in this provider record, we have the uh, multi-addresses that, um, that Bob will, can, can use to connect to Alice. And as soon as Bob finds this provider record, they're actually able to uh, establish a direct connection. But there's a, yeah, much more to it, of course. Um, so when Alice types PCP send, you receive these four words. These are words from the Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 39, which are actually, which has, 2,048 words in, I think, seven different languages, which are used for these uh, wallet monomics uh, things, so to, to, rec to as, as a seed to generate these wallet details. And so Alice PCP um, process generates four random numbers between zero and 2,048, and then uh, maps it to these four, uh, to these different words out of this word list from this Bitcoin improvement proposal. Then the first word, in this case, float, is considered, like, is considered as a channel ID. And I got all of this, these basic ideas from how Magic, Wormhole, and Croc actually work. So this is the, I consider this the channel ID. And Alice constructs this string, PCP sender 713, which happens to be the, the number or the index of this word float in this list. And then um, it would just take the string, generate the CID, and write the provider record um, in the DHT for this specific, uh, specific CID. Um, but because these provider records have a TTL of 24 hours um, and there are only 2,048 words in this list, there's a very high probability that you have um, a collision here. So what I also add in between is like the timestamp truncated to the last, oh God, I think five minutes or one minute, I, I don't remember. But yeah, just, just a, a timestamp to, truncated to some uh, short amount of time. Uh, just to avoid collisions. And then Alice takes the string, hashes it, generates the CID, um, tries to figure out its own multi-addresses in the network, and then writes uh, the provider record into the DHT, transfers these four words to Bob. Bob types PCP send, uh, receive into uh, his command line and takes the same time, so it's its own perception of time truncated to the last minute, and um, the next the next minute as well, um, and generates the same strings with the same uh, channel ID, arrives at the same CID, and also at another one, because it looks up two different uh, CIDs in this time, in this case, and yeah, just 
looks up the provider record in the DHT and then finds it and finally gets the network addresses to be able to connect to each other. So the next step is, uh, as soon as they have established a direct connection, they do a password authenticated key exchange, which is, which is also something that I got from uh, Magic Wormhole in this case. There's a great talk online from um, uh, its author. And uh, this takes the remaining part of these four words, so the, the remaining three words, and um, uses these three words to generate um, a session, a, a strong session key. So it can, so this PAKE exchange can can take a weak password and um, with some back and forth can generate a strong session key, which would then encrypt all further communication. And in this case, I don't. So maybe there's some security experts here, but I don't think it's super necessary in 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 this particular set, setup if you have like a direct peer peer to peer connection. So I'm rather using this as an authentication mechanism. And then, yeah, after this PAKE exchange was successful, we can finally transfer the bytes. So this is how it works. And um, well, all of this uses a lot of different P2P techniques and, and modules and so on. So um, the first step, um, when Alice types PCP send, there's actually some, some delay. And the first uh, thing that happens is it um, PCP connects to the Amino DHT, which are the IPFS DHT bootstrap peers, um, tries, to, tries with Autonut v2 um, to identify its own addresses. And well, if it's public, it just can continue to write the provider record to the DHT because we have public connectivity. If um, the peer happens to be private, which probably will be the case if you're on a home, uh, home network, um, it, reserve, it will reserve a seat at a circuit relay v2 um, peer in the network, which then will facilitate the uh, hole punch eventually. And there are um, a few other things that happen here. So uh, if you're on a local, if both, both peers are in the local network, it will use MDNS um, to immediately discover peers. This is super fast. Actually, DHTV discovery is also very fast. So as soon as the record is written into the DHT, which can happen, if, uh, which can take a few seconds, um, uh, the discovery itself is actually super fast. Um, eavesdroppers on this connection get no information. And with three words, there are um, 8.6 billion possible combinations that these can have. So um, yeah, and every guess is visible to the user, so which means the security aspect, I think, is OK in this case. And you can always extend the number of, of words that you, that you generate from uh, starting from, from four, uh, four words. Yes, yeah, very good number of words. And yeah, net, net traversal itself is using DCUTR. Um, and uh, which, yeah, as we found out last year, has like a, if, if, the, if both routers support hole punch, punch um, fun, uh, it supports hole punching, the success rate is very high. And in general, um, the likelihood that you have a router that supports hole punching is around 70% as, we as we've seen last year. But there's like a big catch. Um, so as I said, in, so, I, this is, these were my baby sets into, into lip P2P, and I've written this two years ago, and I have not really updated it ever since. It's the current version that's online is 0 0.4, and it's probably not working anymore, and it also doesn't contain all these cool new features like DCOTR, and back, back then it was relying on these relay peers that Protocollabs operated, and I think they were shut down since then. And uh, so I, after the whole punch measurement campaign um, end of last year, beginning of this year, uh, I started semi-actively developing uh, on a new branch, 0 0.5, which should use all these cool new, new lip P2P features. Um, but it's not done yet. And I found that I don't have time really to, con like, to really actively develop, um, f further develop this, uh, this project. And um, well, yeah, just good. let me go through these um, points here. Um, so this project, I wanted to have an emphasis with this rewrite to letting the user know of what went wrong and why it went wrong, just to, to give good feedback. And uh, yeah, other things would include, I want to rename it because of the reasons that, uh, <laughs> that Steve pointed out. Um, so some name bike setting here as well. And there could be also some cool other new features, like um, instead of giving, uh, instead of taking these four words, we can also probably just pass in a CID. PCP could uh, detect this and look up, look it up in the DHT or in an in, in indexer, and then download it some, from somewhere, wherever it is, it, it is hosted. Then other features that are not there yet are trans transfer resumption. Uh, so if, if the if the um, data transfer data exchange fails at some point, and perhaps integrate JSPPP at some point to have CLI browser interop. 
would be really cool. And so I, I thought of giving this talk just Maybe there's, perhaps later it on, uh, on YouTube, someone will see this talk and uh, will get excited about it. And uh, I thought of encouraging someone to reach out to me and perhaps we can uh, work on this because this could be the, the decentralized alternative with, I think, good UX um, that could replace things like Croc and Magic Wormhole. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Dennis, super cool. Um, I am curious, right now, PCP doesn't depend, have any dependencies on IPFS implementations, right? It doesn't have, and, well, it, it kind of depends on the amino DHT, but this DHT. could be ex, ex, replaced with any other DHT, actually. Right, right, and so uh, I really, I think that that's really cool that it's, you know, a super lightweight, like, lib P2P utility. Yeah. So I see value in it not supporting CIDs at all. Um, but, but yeah, adding in CID support would, would definitely be cool, um, but might bloat things. I mean, there, there, there are certainly things that need to work first before we probably go into yeah. supporting CIDs. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I, I actually, I really want to build, um, like a, a Node.js or Dino version of this instead of Go, cause I'm not a fan of Go, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, is that, is that something, uh, you know, you'd like to see? evolve with this type of tool or totally yeah um would this so if you wrote it in in javascript in javascript would this also mean it could theoretically work in the browser at some point potentially yeah, yeah. so yeah, this, yeah. this this would be something that i'd love to see yeah awesome um yeah and in general i think this this project is a really good showcase of all these different pieces working together of, of flippy to p yeah. and yeah so that's why i hope someone could step up and help out yeah. cool thanks yeah, that, that's a great talk. I really like it as well. And I like the, you know, when you compare those four words or three words for the PEG to CIDs, I think the PEG is actually more robust because it's more human readable. Like you look at a CID and what do, what do you do? You look at the first four or five characters or the last four or five characters and you ignore the rest yeah. of it. <laughs> but, you know, those uh, four words are unique. So I'm a big fan of PEG. Um, and going on Russell's comment, you could probably do this yeah, and by WebRTC as well if you have like a home node yeah. and a browser. Going back to what I said this morning, this would be really useful. So I'm curious um, if you played around at all with IP uh, version six versus version four to see if you got any benefits, you know, uh, no. because there's like that public aspect of IP version six that's supposed to be really beneficial. Because uh, I ran across it, so I was curious if, if you ran across it as well. So it might be another avenue to, to give it a shot to see if version right. six yeah. makes any difference in discoverability and accessibility. I don't, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I, I have not played around with it and don't have numbers on if it works better or not. But yeah, okay. uh, certainly something to look into, I think, right. yeah. yeah. And so what, what language did you use for the implementation for the version 0.4? Well, yeah, so this is Go lippy to p It's using Go lippy to p in this case, yeah. So someone proficient in Go could jump in. Yeah. But I mean, if Russell implements the, the JS one. <laughs> and then Rust, yeah, so we have interop, cool, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, great work here, does it seems like multiple users. This to me feels like a extent or a corollary or like to the universal connectivity app, right? Yeah, yeah, like also, yeah showcasing totally. getting it across multiple languages is really going to show the implementation teams mm -hmm. where things break down and also people who want to use libp2p how you put together a integrated example that ex uses a lot of functionality. So I think yeah. You know, especially I guess going back to Juan and Raul's talk, when we think about projects that could have impact and retro uh, retro PGF, like uh, this seems like a good thing to have a, a bet on, or for teams to proactively um, put forward, because I could see a lot of meta benefits from something like this. So yeah. anyway, thanks for like putting to get you know starting yeah. this idea. I hope really this cool. was inspiring and yeah, uh, yeah, that was awesome. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.